East Tumor is the perfect artist. I'm kind of worried about this episode because just like the figure themselves, East Tumor, this is so, can be so scattered in my thinking because as much as I've tried to organize my thinking in this, I just think that it's very hard to explain something that's very kind of visceral or deep in my heart. But it, I needed to talk about them because if you've been a friend of mine, a personal friend of mine, I have been hammering, <laughs> beating the drum of each tumor for many, 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 many years about why this artist is the perfect artist. And what does that mean? To me, it means like, if you're going to, not you, as in speaking directly to you, but if if you are going to be in the game of music as an art form, not as a commercial enterprise, but also develop and also produce something that's meaningful and impactful and long lasting, then I think that Eve's Tumor is the, the prototype to model yourself on. Now, can you even do that? No, of course you can't. You can't manufacture the kind of story, path, and expression of some this said artist. But I've spoken to many an artist who over the years and have said, you should check out this artist because this is, I respect so much about them and I can't wait to unpack it in this episode. Hello. Derek G Speaks Volumes is the name of the show. I am your host. You know what I didn't realize and I still don't realize and I have to like actually delete it from my brain is who listens to this podcast because I've had some really interesting conversations lately with people from different uh, and varied industries. I just think I'm talking to, you know, the odd random internet person that has a, a, an amorphous figure that I can't quite put my finger on. But no, so whoever you are, whether you're an amorphous figure or if you are someone of, of, of uh, note with, with it or withstanding um, within it, within an industry, I appreciate listening because um, I enjoy doing these. It feels like a very honest and pure expression of my thoughts and analyses and that you take the time to listen is um, I'm more than grateful for because you don't have to agree with everything I say. I'm just trying to portray my perspective, which is singular, but uh, I guess global to an extent to maybe you'd enjoy it, whether you know about this topic or not. So, Eve's Tumor. Chapters for this thesis. So the thesis is Eve's Tumor is the perfect artist. There should be a, a, like a preface by saying, is it Eve, is it Eve's, is it Tumor, is it Tumor? I've heard all different types. Uh, I say he's tumor. So let's go with that. The th that is the thesis that they are the perfect artist. Some of the chapters are why I'm the biggest fan, an inaccurate timeline, the artist's journey, live and persona, the dimensions of listening and comparisons. Fun, right? I think so. Okay, let's start with this because you might not know who East is and I want to give you the best context text to make this in episode as interesting as possible. Oh, I'm just going to speak as if I'm speaking to one of these said artists about why I love this artist so much. And I think it does start with the <laughs> uh, an exhale of oh. the best way to describe this artist is that they are an underground artist hiding. No, or maybe the other way around. This is why it's confusing. A mainstream artist hiding in an underground artist body. And what do I mean by that? The way that they have put out music, they've been putting out music since about 2010, I think, under a variety of different names that I didn't know of. There's a whole discography that uh, I should probably work back a little bit. Um, people believe their name is Sean Bowie. It is understood that they are non-binary, although I've read interviews where they have said themselves that it is not something that they are interested in discussing or exploring. So they have been referred to as a he as well, um, interchangeably. And I think, okay, without giving too much of the episode away and jumping ahead, I think why I'm the biggest fan is because they are 
so willing to go from the most ex exist on both extremes of music. So they developed up in a certain scene, became an experimental artist, explored that experimental ambient, and now is making Britpop essentially. And that in itself is it as an American, as a Texan from Austin, uh, no, Tennessee, Knoxville, Tennessee, apologies, is so exciting. And I think that when you look at artists who are trying to be artists, right, they are making kind of generic pop music, rap music, whatever, but they're putting on these personas of wearing crazy outfits and, and you know, making interesting social media assets. To me, that's not art. What is art is actually kind of having the knowledge, respect, love for all media, mediums, genres to the point where you can do anything and you choose to do this. Does that make sense? I have a note here that says the power of the universe in their hand, <laughs> which is kind of to say that here's a good, here's a good analogy. This artist could be a fine dining chef who can make the greatest meal in the world and they decide to make the best cheeseburger in the world because they've made it all, they've tried it all, and they're going to perfect it with the most basic thing. And I think that they hold the art in such a regard that they let the music do the talking. And it's so compelling to me from a very deep place of like, I think as a music fan, I respect, not that you need my respect, but I personally respect someone who respects the art so much that you've gone through it all and anything is possible. Anything is possible, which is exciting. So that's why I'm the biggest fan of each tumor. But let's go through an inaccurate timeline. And I say inaccurate because I know that I am a man speaking down the lens of a camera, uh, riffing to an extent. And uh, I don't want you to think that I'm whole, <laughs> you should hold anything to factual account. But uh, basically, Sean Bowie is believed to be their name, but they've gone by so many other names, including Bekele, Barhanu, Shanti, Teams before East Tumor. And uh, Knoxville, Tennessee felt quite ostracized in their environment, listened to classic rock, Zeppelin, and, and also not that it's classic, but grunge, Nirvana, and things like that, but then also grew up around a lot of Motown, so they said, uh, with their dad. So soul, rock in their roots, essentially. When they started to develop in the 2010s, they were kind of making some like Dilla-esque stuff, some vaporwave type stuff. There was this kind of like sound that was very internet and very like, I believe that they used to make music, you know, recording from the mic in, in bills into the laptop because they didn't have uh, any better facility at that time. So if you look back at some of these artists, whether it's Shanti or Teams, or, there's albums on YouTube. That's the only place you'll be able to find it. So there's this like almost proof of work, you know what I mean? Where there's this like really quality, nice stuff, but there's too much music and it's kind of great. And like when we talk about like building worlds and how it's great for artists to build worlds, I think that the best artists build worlds because they are that they, they built it without being conscious of building the world, you know? So that makes it infinitely more exciting. So there's the, that whole thing. Then Ease Tumor was... Uh, premiered, uh, debuted in 2015 um, as this kind of uh, more experimental uh, ambient artist. And I became aware of them with the release under the um, experimental ambient label called Pan, based in Berlin, and an album called serpent music i never i remember seeing the cover and the cover was 
this is the best way I can describe it. He, he looks like a non-binary Travis Scott covered in like lace and, and you know, f- uh, velvet and it was red and shiny and red and white and shiny and, and evocative. Immediately, when you put out album covers, you need to portray what the music sounds like. I think that most artists don't under, I, I think most under, artists underestimate the power of an album cover. And when you can pr- fully harness the sound in an image, then you know who you are, you know? And this really caught my attention. I'm like, wow, what is that? Who is that? And um, was a combination of ambient um, with a slight hip hop and R&B twinge to it as well, which was kind of cool um, with some real like vast soundscapes, if you will. And it was just like, there, there, there's a track in there that kind of is almost like a R&B beat, but then the rest of it is kind of weird and, and ever evolving and changing. And I'm like, I'm in, I'm compelled. What is this? I haven't heard anything like this before. I haven't heard, seen an artist like this before. And then in 2017, they released a record on SoundCloud when SoundCloud was still a thing called Experiencing the Deposit of Faith. And it was a uh, a free download record that was kind of like gospel ambient with some beats, you know? And I remember just telling my friends, I'm like, check this out. They're like, dude, you're obsessed with this person. And I'm like, I am. Because it was like, it was free. Love that. Gospel. It just added to this world of just being weird and like, this is an official, I'm just giving this stuff away. Um, felt a bit rebellious. And then after that released, um, came came as this, into, entered from this like person that kind of presented themselves, you know, alternatively, but also quite um, uh, normally entered the world with uh, a character that kind of looks like a character out of the musical Cats, like f- covered in fur with, you know, and like these, these platform heels that were like, I don't even know, 15 inches high and green and black and, you know, just all types of mess. But then at the same time came out with, I think that's when Noid came out, this kind of like, it sounded like Blur. And you're like, what? <laughs> you're, coming, you're coming from Pan, the label. I think at this point they were signed to Warp, one of the most iconic record labels of all time. And, you know, the label of Aphex Twin, for example. And you're like, Brit, Britpop? What do you mean? And I could think that that album, Heaven to a Tortured Mind, uh, wasn't the most refined, but it, I think what I liked is that the artist was unafraid to challenge themselves and challenge everyone else and be like, just imagine if I was a rapper, imagine, imagine, <laughs> quite likely. Um, and then suddenly about faced and went, no, I'm a folk singer. I actually really love that so much. If you think you can pull it off, and I think that Eve's tumor can pull it off, I think that's the main thing. Is like, do you respect it? Do you love it? Do you have something to contribute? And they do. And it's like, I'm kind of into this. And then there was an EP after that. I forget the name of it, but it has the song Crash Velvet in it. An incredible, timeless, psych pop song. Uh, you know, Brit pop song, whatever you want to call it. They put out this very luscious record that that is just the same quality and dedication as uh, their other work but a completely different genre and it's like guitar based you know psychedelia incredible and just released an album uh this year called i have to read this praise a lord who choose but which does not consume who heavy 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 Good, 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 uh, um, very poetic name. But yeah, so that is an inaccurate timeline. You can already tell what I love about this artist. So the next chapter is the artist's journey.
Now, I think a lot about music and art and fine art. And as I am more of a music commentator these days, I do think about the different types of artists. You have underground artists, you have artist artists, you have what I'm now defining is, which is obvious, but I didn't really define them until recently as radio artists, which is like people that are completely out of my uh, purview. The the Ed Sheerans, the Taylor Swifts, the Katy Perrys, the Lady Gagas, who are purely and simply making commercial pop music for the masses without, you know, which is pop, like in that kind of like sugary pop way that's going to be popular and going to be number one around the world. But it's kind of like big pop artists from any era that don't necessarily stand the test of time, but people, there'll be generations that listen to, them, listen to them forever. You know, I think that those are radio artists. And I think that uh, there's the artist artists, which are the ones that like our ambient artists say and remain ambient artists forever. And I don't mean that as a dig. I mean that because that's the purity of what they want to explore. That's all they want to explore. Take Alvin Noto, for example, um, you know, electronic glitch space or Roji, Akeda and their music. And it's just like, this is what I'm making and this is pure and this is not commercial and it's not for you. It's not for most people, but it's my journey. Underground artists is people that want to make it in the mainstream. And I think that uh, why I've always talked about Eves as the, uh, as the uh, prime example for artists <laughs> that I think they should aspire to be is that person that is almost like a fine artist, is almost like um, an Andy Warhol, or perhaps like a, a modernist or a minimalist a fine artist, um, whereby they studied all of the traditional classical ways of painting, of sculpture, they studied it all. They produced a whole body of work that fits into those boxes. They can paint or they can sculpt, you know, like Michelangelo, they can, they can paint like Van Gogh, but then they decide to present you a shiny cube on a pedestal, you know? That's how I think that where this artist exists in, to be honest, quite singularly, um, in that they experimented in this this like more vaporwave space and then kind of got into the noise and ambient space and then got into the as well as like this kind of R and B hip hop background space, but then went into this pop space. And I think that ultimately that is uh, a very, uh, it's almost like I'm going to harness the creativity around these genres to make the simplest thing possible that you can consume and enjoy, and, but still have those layers. So the best example of this is, um, I've told this story before, but I think it's important to say it here. And this kind of bleeds into the next section. Uh, of uh, live and persona. Um, when I went to go see Eve support um, Ruchi Sakamoto in 2018, I think it was the year, and I was so excited and I brought my friends along and I'm like, check out this artist. You know, they're experimental. I said R&B, people don't like to hear that, but like there are beats, see elements to it in there. Like people could argue about genres, but like it's ambient, but then there's like, other elements to it. They're kind of sexier and 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 chopped up and sampley. And um I get there and they played a noise set covered in blood. And it was really somewhat disappointing, surprising. My wife was there. I was like, wait for it, wait for it. This other music's gonna come in, wait for it. And it was literally feedback for for an hour. It was quite horrible. But walking away, I'm like, that is so sick. That is so cool. Because they are doing them. Don't expect anything out of me. I'm doing me. <laughs> and who knows what the brief was? Maybe it was to do something completely experimental. Uh, maybe they said, do what you like. And they said, I'm going to do this. And I think that 
But then to come out and do Britpop kind of says like, yeah, you were, you were always in there with those sounds growing up with Jimi Hendrix, Nirvana, Led Zeppelin to, to come out of the gates with something completely different. And um, to me is kind of presents to me a student of the art of music while still wanting to reach as many people as possible. And I think that that's where like the underground artists or the artist artists never get to because they don't want to sell out or they want to make it, but they don't know how to transform their raw talent into a commercially viable career. So let's talk about live. So you guys should check out uh, the Hood by Air performance that East Tumor did in 2016, HBA. It was, they played a zombie and it was a runway show and there was a mound of dirt and they had to kind of walk in, the models had to walk in and around and over, not in the dirt, on the dirt mound. It's quite large. It was like definitely like four feet high at least. And Ease was kind of performing in and around it with a microphone, playing a zombie. <laughs> and as they were performing, were like lunging at, diving on, attacking the models. <laughs> It's just like, what are you doing? Uh, and it's kind of amazing. It's on YouTube, Hood by Air. Um, it, it's kind of amazing to see an artist so free in their expression and not try to be anything that they are not similar. You know, like like I said, a couple of years later doing a noise set. It's like, who are you? I think most people try, like artists, I've seen artists when they're like got like 2,000 followers and they're trying to be mysterious and weird and like no one even knows who they are or cares. Um, I think that there is this thing of like you build this platform, right? You build this persona and you build this hype and then you tear it down. It's like, I remember I used to work with this TikTok influencer with like millions and millions of followers. And they said to me, look, if, if I had to start my account again, I could get all this audience back. And I'm like, really? Being a content creator now, I do understand what they're saying. It's like, if you believe your content is good and of quality and is original, there's no one to compete with. You don't lose out. You're just doing, you've only got yourself to battle with. And this is the same with, with Ease. It's like, you build up this persona and then you just destroy it. You tear it down and start again. And then you build up something else. Um, which is why when they eventually got to Britpop, it's like, what the fuck? This is amazing. What made you go here? <laughs> so I think that the other part of it is persona. They are very, very, very aware of their persona online and in the public eye. And they dress up in these really like crazy, so almost like a person of the fifth, fifth element. And they're very conscious of not giving too much away. So like the most obvious example of people like Marshmallow or who else? Um, MF Doom in masks. People are like, oh, these people care about the art only and don't care about any kind of person, personality comparisons and things like that, which I do agree with. But Ease is kind of doing it in this glam rock art pop way where they, you can see their face, you know what they look like, but then also as this character that when I said, when I said that you don't know their names officially, there's so many different pseudonyms. You don't really interact with the person, you just interact with the artist and then everything else is like non-existent. I like that. Is that a harder road? Because you are you Matty Healy? from the 1975 who likes to use their personality as a form of marketing you know it's harder to be silent i think but i think that i've read interviews with eves tumor where they've really said i want the music to speak for itself and to me it does and i think there is a real passion for this artist beyond most artists out there because you can tell that they love the art and that they have built this persona to fully encapsulate the idea of the artist and then no more. So you don't really know huge amounts about their 
gender identity. You don't know huge amounts about their name or their backstory. You don't know what their views are on grand political things that are happening at the moment because they put it in their music and you can figure that out at some point if you if you care to listen. So the next chapter is the dimensions of listening, which I think, as you can probably tell where I'm going with this, I think that why for many people this artist is so compelling is because they, when you listen to the Britpop type music, then you kind of are also experiencing the gospel. You're also experiencing the ambient. You're also experiencing the glam rock and the psychedelia at the same time because you know where they came from in order to come to that point. So you listen to it as a fan of what they've been able to produce, the simplicity of what they've been able to produce as a pop star, not mainstream, but a pop star, an alternative pop star that is able to produce something of um, kind of more commercial merit. So when I listen to it and it's got these really interesting but quite traditional structures, you're like, man, this is the same person and it's just as good, but it's just different. It's not lean back and weird. It's just like in your face, but really beautifully developed and, and instrumented and mixed and, and mastered and all that sort of stuff and, and expresses itself in the same way. And I think that I really like the having these dimensions to listen to. I think in terms of genres, I, re I wrote down a few of what East Tumor would be categorized in. Should I say up until this point, this is almost like a beginner's guide. I should have said this at the beginning, but anyway, it is a bit of a beginner's guide as much as it is my thesis about being the perfect artist. Some genres for you. Noise, ambient, R&B, Britpop, psychedelia, industrial, dream pop, vaporwave, glam rock, gospel, alt rock, big beat, hip hop, new wave, punk. Personally, I'm quite tired of seeing articles that say genreless, genre bending. I don't believe that that is a real thing. I think it's because perhaps the, the writer's vocabulary isn't one that can explain what they're listening to. There are things where genres do develop, but East Tumor is not genreless. There's just too many of them to be able to put them in one. Genre bending. Um, but yeah, I really think that imagine being having noise and glam rock, hip hop and psychedelia and industrial in the same sentence, you know? Comparisons, I think, is a really good way to to compare this artist too many others um, because, and when I say comparisons, I found myself in a little bit of a strife because when I was comparing Ruchi Sakamoto to other artists, I began comparing them to who is better. And that's dangerous because I don't believe that I'm in doing that sort of thing. But then I ended up arguing with myself about who's more significant, Ruchi Sakamoto or Brian Eno to myself in my own head. I mean, like in terms of uh, identity, right? So, Dean Blunt, obvious, very good uh, artist, artist in the hip hop world. One of those artists that will remain underground, doesn't want to be known in any huge regard, makes beautiful but subversive hip hop rap. Flying Lotus to an extent in the kind of like, I will do what I want to do. I could make whatever I want to make. And I decide to make this because I'm so talented at it. Mark Boland from T-Rex, I think just, I just think there's an energy there of like this psychedelic glam rock star uh, that is so kind of um, hard to explain, hard to kind of fully encapsulate their existence. They're kind of fluid in their identity as well. David Bowie is the most obvious next one. Um, David Bowie did mostly exist in in the kind of pop tropes rather than like super experimental, but had that two of them. And it also had the like fluidity of identity and the idea to break down and build back up Ziggy Stardust and, and the variety of other personas that they portrayed. So I wouldn't be surprised if Eve's tumor came back and Britpop was dead and now was like a, like art rap <laughs> artist, really. Um, so Bowie is close and Sean Bowie, Say that his name is that named after Bowie? Is that his real name? Who knows? Who 
who knows? Travis Scott, in many ways, I compare him to as well, uh, because there's like this kind of like creative director, art director, um, masher of sound together, and is in the hip hop space in a way that's also psychedelic. I think Travis Scott deserves more respect for that, but you know, I think the people that know know that. MIA is is potentially there as well. Um, the kind of punk aspect to it, the artfulness to it, the kind of like ability to be uh, quite pop, but then ability to be quite like aggressive as well. The list could go on. Um, I don't think he's necessarily like Ryuchi or Tom York, but not not either in terms of like hunger for experimentation and and the appreciation of sound. But if you hadn't heard about Yves Chimba before, I think that hopefully I've given you enough of a framework. So my concluding thoughts are this. I think that art and upholding of the art of music is a very important thing. I also know that most musicians that make really special things don't get any as much acknowledgement as they should because they don't make things that are commercially viable to any extent. So what ends up happening usually is the underground develops these new sounds, takes five years until it, it kind of like reaches a level where mainstream artists are able to take that and exploit that for all it's worth. And I think there are people like Dean Blunt that kind of exist in this space that people that are really kind of like deep in music respect and love and kind of want everyone to know about them but definitely don't want them people to know about them because they're really doing it for quote unquote the right reasons and define the right reasons because i think taylor swift is making music that's not for me but is inspiring millions more than dean blunt whereas like dean blunt is the idol of asap rocky and and rappers such as that. So it's like, I think these underground people often inspire the mainstream artists to create something and often collaborate with these people as well in order to make their existence or their, 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 the world they be built commercially viable. And I think that when I speak to musicians who are trying to find their place in the world and they're trying to, uh, they dream of being a musician. They, they call themselves an artist and they want to make an impact and they want to have a legacy. And I always lean back or jump back to referencing Eves as like something to aspire to, which is like a love for music, all music, and a love for being brave and following an instinct whereby you can... Uh, tear it all down and build it back up and that you want to communicate whatever you need to communicate in the most purest way possible. And if that means dropping being an ambient artist, which people are probably like, oh, I can't wait to see you at the ICA doing an ambient set in the future. But then they come out and they're playing something that sounds like Damon Alban that you're kind of like respect. And I'm not, that's not to say that artists need to like tear up the rule book and start again, but I think a lot of artists need to at certain parts of their career because they're like lacking in any inspiration. I think that people like Kanye West are probably the best current example of that where it's like, okay, I've achieved boom, bap, backpack, backpack rap. I'm going to go, I'm going to go sing and then I'm going to go all like industrial. And I think, uh, I think once people, artists find success, they're often follow the the same path that has been put in front of them by like you are a country singer you need to be a country singer it's like uh is it tim mcgraw is that his name i'm sorry the um, i'm not fully familiar with the world but there's this country artist it might be him who put out an r&b album under a pseudonym that was meant to be part of a film that never came out and um it, actually the song from that he made was amazing but he had like he had he dressed differently he wasn't like a cowboy hat he had like a goatee and an emo haircut but like in order to to express a different side of their their love and passion for music they had to kind of like 
produce an alter ego and then people found out who that was, you know? So I think that I like the bravery in like, in that so much, but that's just very personal. And I think that why I use Tumor as the perfect artist is because they, they see the art for what it is. They see the commercial constraints and realities of it. They also see the, the limitless expression of it and the Andy Warhol or Picasso example of like, you can do the fine work, but then you can also challenge people, but make it something that is infinitely more interesting and palatable at the same time and challenging and original makes it all the more juicy. And um, I cannot get enough of anything that East Tumor makes. I just, anything comes out, I just, I don't, fanboy over much but i do fanboy over over this artist because it's um brings me joy to no end to to kind of have this like feeling in your throat or in your stomach where it's like what's gonna happen next and whoa it's just getting even more grand and that's where that's where they're going it's a it's a pure love fest and i think that i'm i uh now that i'm at the end of, of this thesis i think that uh i'm happy it wasn't a complete mess i hope you thought it wasn't a complete mess too that is the thesis. What did you think? Let me know if you agree, disagree, if you if you think that this artist is important, maybe they're not. I've, I've been thinking lately about like collecting records because I get offered to be sent records all the time and I don't, I decline them because I don't really like collecting records. I would love to collect records of certain artists. I'd like to collect the full discography of Eves. Uh, I saw someone on TikTok who collected the full discography of Sophie, that would be cool. I'd love the full discography of Ryuchi. I'd rather be like someone that has like particular people than just like everything. Cause like, or really banging spiritual jazz collection. I would really love as well. Uh, but that takes time and money, which uh, I have neither <laughs> kind of <laughs> not poor. Um, I think t as the appendix really, really uh, thrilled with the result of the passion projects series because people have reached out to me that I've known as well as people that I don't know. People that I know, I, I, I get surprised to people that know what I do and listen to what I do. And I'm happy to that they can hear more of my story and be inspired by it. Um, and also contribute as much as I didn't want to put it out. I knew that it would help contribute uh, some focus for some people and some um, uh, ability to relate to a story that isn't, you know, all puppy dogs and rainbows, but uh, is a story of persistently evolving, consistently evolving to get to a place, which was nice. Um, I did do a little Ryuichi Sakamoto uh, three hour radio show on Spotify. Some people might have heard, uh, or I did on the day of or after I found out about his passing. And, and I said this multiple times, I don't make content about people that pass away, but um people were messaging me on my different channels did you hear did you hear how are you da, da, da. And i kind of thought okay i've introduced a ton of people to ruchi i know that from the numbers uh and comments on my different social pages and so i definitely felt a, a compelled to to close that loop and kind of like do something to express uh, my feelings on the matter and now having reflected upon things a lot and now seeing the content kind of uh, machine in motion and seeing lots of Ryuchi content come out and like ah, we all knew this was coming that really his significance and prominence and notoriety would grow you know after he after he passed away because I think that they're uh, only like the headsy NTS shows type thing did specials on him and now my mom knows about him and she messaged me about it you know you know that something you know that you know your mom knows things when she messaged you oh did you hear Richie died I have to listen to his music you know so it's all very sweet uh but it's um I'll leave you with this as the appendix if you can on YouTube uh I think I'm did I mention this somewhere maybe not he did this live performance solo piano recital that uh, the record label invited me to watch um, in December and it was black and white and he played his classic songs 
And at this point, I had I knew that he didn't have much left in him in the tank. And because he put out this compilation, Thousand Knives, I think it's called. Oh, no, maybe it wasn't called that, but it had Flying Lotus and not Flying Lotus, Thundercat and things like that, reimagining his songs. And the press release for that was like, uh, you know, likely, you know, as his health deteriorates, such and such. And I'm like, oh, no. And then this album 12 came out in um, January and um, and it was very much like reflecting upon his deteriorating health. And I'm like, oh, no, is this a David Bowie black star? Is this a Leonard Cohen? I forget the name of his record thing where they pass away and release music. Oh, no. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I knew that it was coming. And when I watched this recital, beautiful, obviously. But then he played Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, and had tears in his eyes. And you saw him finish it. And honestly, I could get upset, but conscious of what forum I'm on, I'm on on YouTube or whatever. I'm not trying to do it for views, but you could tell that he was like, this is the last one. I thought that when I watched it, I'm like, he knows something. He knows that this is it. This is. And to kind of witness that as one of your favorite artists perform something on, on film and knowing that you are about to die or this is the last time you'll ever do it is heavy, man. So heavy. And I remember watching it going, I think my wife was watching it too. I don't think she saw what I saw, but I was like, I know, I just know. And now that you, you go, go find it and watch it. Cause it's like, damn, I think that not many of us have the opportunity is the funny word to, to, ex, to experience death uh, in such a poetic way. Like, I know that sounds like opportunity is a weird word. Maybe that's not the right word, but where you you know that it's coming and you can do something to kind of like really put put that final touch on like what you've done and what you've achieved. Crazy. Anyway, that's the end of the pod. Next week, I don't know. I keep recording different ones and then pushing them back. Who knows what's coming next? But... Thank you for watching, you very important people of many important industries, people of note. Uh, this has been Derek G Speaks Volumes. I appreciate you always, and I will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>